Okay, so welcome to Autistic Pride and Prejudice. Um, happy Pride, everybody. Very excited to be running this event for awesome training. Hi, Julian, how are you? Are you frozen? Is it me or you? You, did you freeze? Was it me or you? Can you hear me? Oh. I'm in the car. You're, break You're breaking up a lot. I don't. Uh, it was me. I'm sorry. I'm in a car. I'm home in just a minute. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen, you're early. So that's fine. Are you coming on? It's half seven. Oh, okay. I thought it was seven. Um, I can do it. It doesn't matter because I, I can take you seven. Yeah. Do you want to just go in? Oh, no, no. No, I, I'll come in at seven. Okay. Half seven. I'll come in at half seven then. Are Sorry. You sure? It's fine. I think it was. Okay. Then I changed it. But it doesn't matter. Jude, I, had, I recorded Jude. So I can put, do that later if you want to go now. Welcome to our organized webinar called Autistic Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> um, I'm going to wait for Gillian to go home anyway, because, um, it's not, yeah, do you, what do you want to do, Gillian? Seven or half seven? Totally up to you. I'll do half seven. That'll give me a chance to get home. Catch your breath. Okay. Is that okay? Ideal. Thank That's you. Perfect. Brilliant. I'll see you at half seven then. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Brilliant. Okay, so um, that was Gillian. Gillian will be back to us at half seven, as everybody's heard. Um, Gillian is the founder of NeuroPride. So I'm really excited to talk to these fantastic people this evening. Mackie's popping in to say hello as well. Hurry. Hi, Mackie. Are you there? Are you just testing? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm alive. It's super early. You're not until eight. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I know. No, I thought I'd just stick my head in just to check and see what's up. That's just good. to make sure you're not up to any nonsense. I know what you people are like. You do. So keep an eye on you, you know. You do. <laughs> um, so, oh, has someone had a Q&A already, is there? No. Oh, Damon. Hi, Damon. How are you? Brilliant. Welcome. Um, There should be some more people joining the webinar, or maybe people just signed up for the recording, so we'll see. Um, what do you want to do, Mackie? Do you want to hang around or do you want to not make faces? I just want to pull faces at the camera. <laughs> um, um, oh, we're talking about prejudice and pride. <laughs> yes. No silly faces. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, this is Mackie, who um, is my friend and colleague uh, here at Awesome Training. Um, what, what are you going to do? Do you want to come back at eight? Oh, hang on. I, I just realized I, knew, I should be acting like a grown up here. Hang on. <clears throat> Yes, that's much better. Um, um, you know what I want to do? You're, um, okay, yeah, I'm not until late. I just want to pop in and kind of see what's no happening. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a good idea. Why don't I turn off my microphone and my camera and I'll leave you to it and you can go and harass me at eight o'clock. Yeah, your sound is fuzzy now. If you do the th sit back, it's better, I think. Try that again, actually. I'm so glad I'm recording saying. all of this. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, that's cool. Right. Um, I'm going to pretend you're not here now. Is that all right? <laughs> I'm going to disappear. Bye bye. Okay, see you later. Bye. So that was Mackie. Mackie was at eight o'clock. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, welcome, welcome, welcome. We have people in the webinar. So, say hello. Tell me where you're from. What? Um, why you came along this evening? I love knowing why people came. Um, you can use the chat. Um, to ask us questions and interact throughout. If you're watching us live on Facebook, you can do the same in the comments under the, the live video. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So um, I'm going to start. So basically, this is part of, of Noor Pride, um, which is the second year of um, Noor Pride events in Ireland. Um, we'll be talking to Gillian later more, who actually founded it and is doing amazing stuff for our community here. And um, I suppose Awesome Training really wanted to do something this year and, and you know, autistic, I think um, talking about autistic pride and prejudice um, is a good thing to talk about um, because along with pride is kind of like, well, why do we need pride? We need to talk about the reasons why we need that also. So 
Um, Jude um, couldn't join me live this evening because he double booked himself, um, something I do frequently. So we had a, a chat earlier today. So I'm going to play that first. So we won't be able to interact with this one, but do use the chat, do ask questions, and I can get to those afterwards. But unfortunately, Jude couldn't be here with us live, but he sends his love. I'm going to um, play that for you now. And I'll actually mute my, no, I can't mute myself. I'll just turn off my video. Excellent. So I will be distracting you. Hi, welcome Jude. Thanks so much for coming to talk to me today. We're going to talk about Authentic Pride and Prejudice with Jude Morrow. Jude, um, I'm sure lots of people are familiar with you, but you want to give a quick intro to yourself, what you do, why you're here, your books. Tell us all about you before we start talking uh, about Pride and Prejudice. Thanks very much for the intro. I'm delighted to be here for some Autistic Pride and Prejudice. Uh, my name is Jude Morrow and I am an author. A turn speaker, a TED speaker, the founder of Neurodiversity Training International, and gosh, I do lots of things. I'm a very, I'm, I'm a very busy person. The typical kind of autistic kind of busyness. Um, I'm the director of uh, MD Initiatives at RTM Mental Health Solutions, and I do training a consultancy with Potentia Workforces in Texas. And um, I suppose a little bit of a brief background to me. Uh, I am as society normally depicts the so-called typical autistic person being a white middle-class boy um, and whenever i was going through school i was among the first kind of autistic pupils to go through the mainstream school system because if i was born in 1980 instead of 1990 the chances of me going to an SEN school would have been much, much higher. So I went through that kind of school existence. And one thing that really gets to me is whenever people say, oh, my autistic child is in a world of their own. I was very much not in a world of my own. I was in the same world as everybody else and thinking, I don't yeah. belong here. I'm not accommodated here whatsoever. Everything I do is wrong. And my number one goal in life, up to I was about 25, and I'm now 32. My main goal in life was, when I opened my eyes, how can I not disappoint everybody today? Because we've got so many kind of quirks, traits, characteristics, whatever, that people just frown upon completely. And I don't understand why people frown upon them completely. Like, even whenever I ask people, well, what, what would indicate to you that your child is autistic? And they say, oh, they line things up. And I, I was a liner upper and still am a liner upper. And the, the kind of thought out there that there are parents between this person are lining things up, keeping things ordered, that's somehow a, a misfiring trait. It's the, the weirdest thing in the world to me. I don't understand it. And then even whenever I do live stuff, when I say, how did you all get here? Oh, we all drove and in the car park. All the cars are in the line. It's like, well, how, how come, you know, orderly kind of mimicking play is round about? It's, it's very, very strange. And I suppose how I kind of got out of the rut of having to feel that I had to please everybody all the time was to be more proud and accepting of who I am. And now hopefully I can help people to be proud and happy within themselves. Yeah, because you the way I felt. You've had quite a journey because um your book, the first book, Why Does Daddy Always Look So Sad, is your journey towards acceptance, really. Yeah. I mean obviously you know, the language is a bit different, a bit more medical than you you'd probably use now, but when you wrote that, it was like your journey to accepting yourself because it's really hard to accept yourself when you feel like other people around you aren't accepting you and if people don't cater for your needs and don't respond to you and the way they respond to other people and obviously you grow up feeling that but um yeah so let's talk about the prejudice bit first let's we'll finish on the pride so we do prejudice and pride in this one um how did so growing up what, what were the things that made you feel unaccepted well the first thing and i don't think this is talked about anywhere near enough right is the notion of autistic people children and adults 
they he eaters, right? Cookie eaters. Oh, I know, I know. Like this whole thing about picky eaters and people self-identifying as I am a very picky eater, right? Because up to I was maybe nine or ten, I loved on digestive biscuits and milk. Whole milk and digestive biscuits. That's it. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, every meal I had. That was what I loved on. Um, you know, I get people saying to me now, oh my autistic child loves and only two or three things, or they only eat five things. But let's kind of dispel the notion that autistic people are picky eaters. For example, for you, Evelyn, would you ever call a vegan a picky eater? <laughs> no, see, that's the thing. It's the wrong term altogether, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you would never call a vegan a picky eater. That's a dietary preference or requirement. Mm. Even, even uh, certain religions that have uh, not food restrictions, I don't know the correct terminology. For example, the kosher diet. Yeah. No, you wouldn't refer you know, to Jewish people as picky eaters. Yeah. But yet we're kind of left with the label of we are picky eaters. And I think picky implies the picking and choosing, that there's a choice. A lot of times there is no choice. I can't eat a whole range of stuff because it makes me gag, it makes me physically sick. And I know that by looking at it, I know by looking at the texture, I know if there's bits in something, I know, you know what I mean? It's just I know because I know myself and I know my limit. I'm sure you're the same. Um yeah. and then yeah, you know, and then you have parents of children who are worried naturally, obviously, you know what I mean? Because we're kind of all taught, oh, they have to eat this, they have to have five a day, blah 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 blah. Um and then, you know, there's this stress and trying to get your child to eat more. Whereas, like, a lot of us, we just kind of start expanding naturally. But we feel safe as well. I feel that, like, when we feel kind of safe in our environment, we kind of might explore new things a bit more. But even at that, there are certain things I just will never eat and can't eat, I'm sure. What are you like now? Do you eat everything now? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't eat everything. I don't do pulpy yogurt. Um, it has to be smooth. Uh, I... I don't do cucumbers. I don't do peppers. It's a texture thing. Yeah. Um, but what 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 I do is I make I like things that are sore to eat, like chili oil, chili sauces, really hot mustards. So it's like a sensory seeking form of food where I have very, you know, three ends of the scale. Like I mean, I I like vanilla ice cream with no toppings on it. Just yeah. plain yeah. vanilla ice cream. And then on the other side, you know, I like a vanilla. But there's that, that's perfect. That's personal preference. Do you know what I mean? Like, and plain vanilla ice cream is perfectly and lovely on its own. And some plain foods are are just as nice than having 25 things, you know, all shoved together. Um, what other things did you feel like that weren't accepted? Um, your, your play is obviously a big thing. Uh, yeah. Your eating. What else? What other things? The way I prepare my own company where it was like oh dude join in oh dude play you know and, and things I didn't I didn't really want to do where I, I am and always have been a huge fan of my own company where if you prepare your own company you're kind of attached with a label of anti-social or that you lack social skills I mean whatever they are because there is no Magna Carta or there is no Ten Commandments or Bill of Rights, or whatever it may be, a problem to outline what exactly positive social skills are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There isn't. No, there isn't. communicating lots of different. This is the problem. We're kind of experts will tell us, or people believe there's like one way to do things. Like this, this, I can't, like, there's multiple ways of doing things, usually, <laughs> in most instances. So obviously, communication falls under that. There's multiple ways of communicating, people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different families, different whatever, you know, I'm going to communicate in different ways. There's not just one way to interact with people. Um, and obviously how you feel about yourself is very much involved in how you interact with other people. If people are welcoming and you feel equal to them, well, then you're going to be inclined to interact with those people. If those people want, you're trying to force feed, <laughs> you know, looking at you like you're playing wrong, doing everything wrong. How you interact with that, those people is obviously going to be different. You'll feel different about yourself. So, like, how we feel about ourselves obviously is a massive part of that as well. 
So if people, obviously there were attempts to try to engage you, Jude, the child who wanted to play alone. Uh, what was that like for you when people kind of, I suppose, were trying to help? Because we know this is a big problem. The people who are with the best of intentions trying to help um, would actually kind of end up doing some harm. What was that like? That's the worst thing, isn't it? When you know there's people out there that are trying their best, they're only going by what they've been taught. You know, the being autistic is fundamentally wrong and they need to be taught to fit in in order to not be bullied or picked on by their peers. Yeah. Because that's what they're taught. I mean, it's systemic almost. Yeah. And for me personally, I just remember feeling that I don't want to do this, but I know I have to. But I'm with everybody. Like, I do, like in primary school, they do things like that. And I remember it. And I actually was going to write about it in the first book, but I, I didn't. And I don't know why I didn't. I wish I had, had included it. Well, you know, like parachute games. Yeah. Like, see the sound of that parachute? The, you know, I, I don't know why. And then, you know, you have to go around with a parachute and it's all different colors and stuff. And it's like, this is like really odd to me and I, I don't like it and it's 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 too colorful it's too like noisy i just i don't i didn't like it and then the feeling of having to suffer through it and then were you like smiling did the people <laughs> teachers or whoever was you know think you were having fun or were you obvious do you know what i mean like because this is important i guess we talk about because Sometimes, you know, we can think just that someone's included. Yay, they're included now. They're they're taking part and that makes everyone else feel good. But it didn't make you feel good. Uh, but how did you look? Or would someone have been able to tell? I, I don't think so. Because in normal everyday situations, you know, there only is one. And that one is Jude Morrow's face. And my my face is the same for pretty much everything, um, except for some things I can get quite animated about. But I would say my face was like indifferent, where they, well, to put it right, there would I I didn't show any signs of distress, which I mean a lot of people would just take to oh well they're enjoying themselves, you know rather than containing the worry and the sadness and the. I hate the sound of this parachute. You know, that's that, 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 that probably where it lay. And having to suffer through it, where, yes, of course, there are things in life that people have to do. You know, you have to obey the law. You have to pay your taxes. You have to do, you know, there's things that you don't want to do, but yeah. have to do. Things that cause obvious stress, for whatever reason, you know, that's where I think it crosses the line for me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know there's, there has to be certain things that we do to live in a society to coexist. But yes, there's a lot of stuff where we need to be way more flexible on. Particularly with children, we're talking children here as well, you know what I mean? How would you, yeah. would you have expressed that stress then, Jude? No, I, would, I wouldn't have dared to stress that whatsoever. I would never have thought to do it because, you know, th they are many. I am one. You know, it's like I'm I'm already because a lot of me in a way wanted to fit in back then. Of course. Where I mean you want to be like everybody, you want to you know, you you want to be, you know, one of the group as well to a certain yeah. extent. But I mean, even because that's just one example as the parachute game. No. I mean, I'm very logically minded, and this is probably why I didn't like them, other than the sensory issues. What benefit will these parachute games have to me in life? You know, what what will I miss out on by not taking part? I'm you know? like as a drama teacher, I used to play parachute games. <laughs> and it's teamwork, cooperation, it's fun, they're learning all these skills, but like when you question it, I'm like, I had to do that. It's not like, is there a point to all these things? Could we do it differently? You know, I mean, 
in your instance, you'd have been better off if you could just sit back and watch or read a book or do whatever you wanted to do yourself. Do you know what I mean? You'd have been happier. Like your mental health, your health would have been better rather than forcing you to do this mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah. And I suppose what you said is very interesting. You know, like kind of they were the many, I was one like that that's what goes on in children's minds as well. So it can look like, and they just feel like they have to have a choice. Um, tell me, because I know we, this, we've talked about this in some of our webinars together about like, because obviously I, I found out as an adult, so I didn't have any of this experience as a kid, special ed or anything like that. But the sensory room, talk to us about. Right. You know what? I, and I love Arsha Jane's point from beforehand. Because it leads in lovely to this point, right? Where if I had just done a monologue out loud about parachute games, but I didn't like parachute games, you know, the chances are if I put that out in a podcast, I would have people emailing me saying, Oh, I, it's, it's clear that autistic children don't like parachute games. Can you help us develop you know, an autism friendly parachute game? You know, you love parachute games. I don't like parachute games. You know, it's, uh, everybody's different. The, the fact is there, there aren't individual relationships formed. You know, that, that's the thing. Like, everybody's different. Now, I know it's, there's a lot of truth in it. You know, if you meet an autistic person, you've met one autistic person, the same as every other human being in the whole world. You know, it's like, when you meet one, everybody has completely different preferences. And I mean, sorry, can I ask you to repeat the question? Because I went off on a mini tangent. Hey, you're fine. It's sensory room. About it. Or sensory rooms. I'm yes, sorry. I'm just good. We love tangents. Sensory rooms. I, I don't know what they're for. I don't, I mean, I, I went in there. To, it wasn't like a sensory room, as you see it now. Right? Like, basically, at the start, Whenever, because whenever I was in primary school, we were talking, you know, early to mid nineties, where it was just a quiet room to decompress. Um, over time, they've become a lot more vulgar, like patterned carpet and lights and yeah. oh, stuff yeah. like this. But but the thing is, is that everybody I talk to, because whenever I go to a school or go to a building or anything, they say, "You've got our lovely sensory room." And I get to see a lot of sensory rooms. And, you know, I say, in, in what way is this used? You know, and I just, I, I don't get, like, I mean, I've sat in sensory rooms in various places as a child and adult and thought, what are they for? I mean, what, 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 what is the reason for this? And, one of the one of the worst things, believe it or not, and this is and now let me finish my point. One of the worst things is carrying out research or surveys with autistic teenagers. And let me tell you the reason. Because I did those and I told people what I wanted to hear. Yeah, the sensory room's great. You know, I'd already been through many, many years of being wrong. And whenever people say, yes, we built this lovely new sensory room, Jim, it has all of these lovely features. Why don't you give us some feedback on this lovely sensory room with these lots of features in it? You know, you're not going to write, this is completely arbitrary. It's completely pointless. And the main reason sensory rooms exist is because a lot of autistic children were asked, what do you think of this? And in fear of judgment, they told people what they wanted to hear and said, yes, they're great. Uh, that's a really good point, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah we do I mean, more people pleasing and telling people what they want to hear. So why we did not do that in in a survey? I would um, say from it's sort of like a I don't know if it's like a subtype of Stockholm syndrome where you don't want to upset your captor, you don't want to upset your oppressor. I would say it. It is. It, it's going to be along that psychological yeah, pattern. It is. It's. It, I mean, it's. It, it, it fits in under masking. You know what I mean? We are literally yeah. trying to appease and study it like your your oppressor. Um. Yeah. That's the thing. I think they sent you in. Like, some kids love them because they're fun. They're like ball pools, whatever. It depends on the room. 
I think it's like people have ideas. I've heard different kind of ideas. People think that you bring the child there so they get sensory input. I'm like, like we're, we're sensitive to the environment. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting input all the time. We don't need specific colors and things like that. So um, it's, I mean, if you want a place to calm, like you want something that, you know, muted tones, like relaxing spaces for that human beings in general find relaxing. Lots of big, bright colors and different things. Um, but I know, like, I know you've said before, that, like, you felt very, like, the punishment sometimes that you were, like, taken out of class and you just, like, mm. stood there until you knew you had to, whatever, um, just bide your time and then go back. And, yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not how it should be. That's not even how it was being used. That's the thing. It was being used with, with well intention. Oh, do you need the sensory break? Do you need to do this? So, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> The thing is, I think some aspects of sensory room, whenever I was younger, was used almost, I felt for me, right? Because the way it worked was I went into school early in the morning and I went into this wee room. The sensory room didn't have a word. The marketing companies hadn't latched onto it yet. And, the, you know, these companies said, oh, we can build you a sensory room and whatever, where it was a quiet room where I could decompress for five minutes 10 minutes before going into the classroom yeah which was and that, yeah which yeah. i felt worked because i either had to get bus to school or walk to school and i was a bit crowded it was like well it was a bit worrying so it was like get the breath back and then go back into class but what i have heard from you know various parents over the years is they said that you know schools or teachers or whatever can almost send a child to a sensory room okay yeah which shouldn't happen where it's almost to you know to quote what others have said to me to calm down from the meltdown or to come back up from the meltdown and that's not what sensory rooms are or what they should be it should be a safe space to take right and it should not be associated with you know, bad behavior in the eyes of other people. Yeah. And a kid should be free. All children, any child should be free to go there when they want it and when they need it. Yeah, it's like a Zen garden, that kind of an idea, just a relaxing space. Um. Mm. Okay, so let's move on to the good stuff, the pride. So <laughs> what happened actually, Jude, in your journey? I suppose you, you reached crisis points, didn't you? And then you yeah. were like, something has to change in my life. Mm -hmm. it's quite a dramatic shift from all the anxiety you had and kind of like self-loathing basically because it's all in your book um to actually accepting yourself and kind of and, and now you're like <laughs> like total of surprise so what happened how did you make the switch it's, it's a it's a fair point like if you had said to me like 10 years ago in 10 years time this is me as a 22 year old which would have been just after ethan was born um if I was going to be talking about this, like on camera and, and going traveling and talking to people about it, I would have laughed at you. Because, I mean, I, what I had done, I developed a mindset of, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. You know, uh, people saying I'm antisocial and all of this, where I was told that I was autistic at 17 or 18. It was around that time. It was before I went to college, but while I was still at secondary school and such form. And I developed a toxic kind of mindset of, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. And instead of, you know, saying, oh, I have no social skills. Well, okay, well, I'm going to become a social worker. And I did. And then when I was 22, Ethan was born. And that was, I mean, that was fun. Um, me and little Ethan. And it was, it was a, a tough journey around that time because, I mean, only six years ago, whenever I was 22, I had a classroom assistant with me everywhere and was the guy with no social skills and had very few friends and so on. And, I, and all of a sudden, I'd be responsible for keeping a baby alive. Like, even though I had a well-paid job, I had my own house, uh, I had my own money, I had my own car and everything else, there was still a lot of me that didn't feel good enough and I felt I had to prove myself to everybody. And it was exhausting. And whenever Ethan was about three, that uh, exhaustion had had such a peak that even Ethan could see it. And that's when he said to my mom, as me, he always looks so sad. 
why does daddy have such a sad face? You know, and it's, it's not that I have a sad face. My face would have been the same as it is now. It's just that I'm not very animated. Like people would say, hello, to a child. I would say, hello, Ethan. But he gets that now because he's nine. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he says, he says no because he's nine and he knows it says daddy dances on the inside. Well, it's such a lovely expression. It's a lovely yeah. I dance on the inside. Because, well, like, you know, he, he says, you know, you don't laugh a lot. And I said, I know. But it's just, it's bizarre to him. You know, but it's like, but it's all he knows of me. Yeah. He doesn't know any, he, he doesn't know any different. And, I mean, whenever I went through, like, counselling and CBT, I know a lot of people are like this with CBT. I seem to be in a, a rare collective of people that I I genuinely find it beneficial to me. Yeah, I mean, it, different things work for different people, and obviously it depends on the therapist and all that as well. So yeah, it, 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 it definitely does. Like I mean, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as that about ABA because as far as I'm concerned, ABA works for nobody, and it has never worked for anybody. No. It's just dog training for autistic children. And do you remember a couple of months ago, I put out like a big. Thing and said, you were are an autistic adult over the age of thirty, going through ABA and have benefited from it. Please let me know. Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. Do you know how many replies I got? One. How many? None. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. None. Yeah. I got none. I got no reply whatsoever. Yeah. None. I think there's Nobody. like one or two people on Twitter who talk about um how ABA helps them, but if you look at how, what they say about themselves, how it helps them, you can see the ableism that it's just literally their own prejudice for them. You know what I mean for themselves. Um, just before we finish, Jude, what would you say to somebody who kind of struggling to accept themselves, but who really wants to, you know, they're listening to people like us talking about like being proud of our identity, um, accepting who we are, flourishing, you know realizing the difference between being autistic and um, trauma and the side effects of growing up in a world that didn't accept us and wasn't all the same to us, separating those two things and going, oh, okay, this is what autistic means. How do you, how, what would you say to help them embrace their identity and to start developing that pride? I would say find your tribe and find your tribe pretty quickly. Like whenever I realized, right, I'm autistic and I even started to tell on people, almost like in the same vein as coming out. Then whenever I was coming out as autistic to people, people were like, oh yeah, no, well, nobody really cared. Yeah. And I, I imagine that's going to be the same situation for most of you watching this and listening to this. Like Evelyn, whenever you started telling people, oh, I'm autistic, were people like, oh, wow, this is an earth shattering revelation or were people just like, yeah, no. Or, yeah, it depends. Yeah, like as in post threats are like, oh, okay, that's cool, whatever. Yeah, some people. Uh, when I to say it, it's funny actually, dude, because when I started like training, and I remember the first time telling a group of people, I was shaking. It was such a big thing to say. It was I was so vulnerable. But now I was looking back, I still hadn't accepted myself. So I still saw like I thought I was telling them I was flawed. <laughs> that's kind of like so that's why it was such a big thing. Um. Uh, and then I just got so used to saying it, uh, it, it became a habit. But people used to be like, oh, because it was so unusual that a person talking about autism would be autistic. That's the thing. Whereas now um, people are a bit more used to that. You know what I mean? It's like Chinese and events we do. There's autistic people in the audience. You know what I mean? The other people, it's, it's not that rare. Whereas like, yeah, for a while I was the only autistic or person who knew they were autistic in a room. Um, so I got a, a, a big reaction to that. But yeah, I mean, really, I think once you get it, once you start saying it, you become more comfortable with it as well. It just becomes like a normal thing. And yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe we do overcomplication a little bit. Um, okay, tell me one message you would give to um, general society. How, you know, it's great that we have proud autistic people in our community, particularly in Ireland, is, is growing really strong. I feel like there's a lot more autistic Irish voices, obviously with Nora Pride to Ireland doing these wonderful events in the past week and organizing things during the year as well. Uh, you know, there seems to be way more pride in our community here in Ireland, um, which yeah. is beautiful. Um, but what can people in general society who are hopefully watching us talking as well, um, what can they do to make that journey for us better or the accepting ourselves 
easier or you know to, to kind of you know share in that pride with us really yeah so what what you know people who aren't autistic or aren't neurodivergent or are part of this community uh, what can they do what message would you send them my, my message will be for everybody else right it'll be for the teachers the parents uh professionals and everybody else because with uh, neurodivergent people you're all fabulous the way the way you are no matter what right and that's why I want to address this to everybody else is the concept of autism racketeering, as I call it. If you look at something and it stinks of this is trying to change my child or change my pupil or change my client, avoid it. Right? Social skills training doesn't work. Communication skills training doesn't work. ABA doesn't work because 50 years ago there were observational signs that cigarettes eased anxiety because whenever people got their smoke they calmed down and these trainings and seminars and whatever about social skills and communication skills this is the modern day equivalent of that and even for, for us for Evelyn and me the fact that there's training out there fundamentally cope with the way we are as people do you not think that's the most disgusting thing in the whole world like, my child is so broken, I need training to cope with them. Dude, How bad is that? Sometimes I kind of think about the, like, I'm here as an autistic person explaining to people that they have to accept people like me. You know what I mean? When you actually kind of think about it, sometimes it's like, yeah. this is just messed up. I mean, it's wonderful that people are interested in learning, but also if you look at the other way, like, why are we, what, how did we get this to here? How, how did we get to this point as a society? You know, um, yeah, it's time for change. Well, um, thank you so much, dude. Um, that is, I think the the odds and racketeering is 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 a really good phrase and people to remember that. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, so fantastic point. Thanks so much for joining me today. Happy Pride, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye, dude. Bye -bye. Hey, okay. So I'm back. Hope everybody enjoyed the chat with Jude. Jillian's here. Hi, Jillian. How are you? You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi, Hi everybody. Sorry about that earlier on. I was okay. in a car. I was mad so dashing around all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to catch a breath. Nah. <laughs> I did have a moment of why in the name of God did I say I'd do something today? But uh, I yeah. did say to. <laughs> You've been yeah, organizing serial, serial. Oh, sure, no, we'll be granted. We granted. Yeah, yeah, I was like, what are, I did say, I'll ask some other people, Jillian, because you're doing so much for the last you know, few weeks, if more than that. Look, Evelyn, like, Evelyn, when you have a situation where you're in the middle of one Zoom meetup for NeuroPride, text and one of the other organizers going, do you know, kids would love this. Let's do a kids edition next weekend. Um, yeah, so tell yeah. us about that. So tell, okay, tell us uh, about, so. For people who don't know this is Gillian from um, Neuropride Ireland. So you're one of the founding members of Neuropride. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we're talking about Pride and Prejudice today. So let's start with Pride because I thought you did it backwards. We talked about Prejudice first. So tell us, um, like, why you set up Neuropride, I suppose, because that, that's, that's a pretty big question, isn't it? It's going to answer <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, you know, like we were sitting around with nothing to do. So no. Yeah. Um, what happened was, I don't know if people are aware that Autistic Pride is on the 18th of June. Um, but a lot of our community are also members of the queer community and we're like, and also activists and involved in all of this. And it was just, do you know, I remember one year, it the picnic, the Autistic Pride picnic happened the day after Dublin Pride. And people were like, oh Jesus, like we just can't keep doing this. Like it's, there's too much going on. So we were like, well, why don't we just move it? Why don't we move it? Uh, to August, because you know, AU for gold. August. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons that were good for us. So we looked into it, and we found that the original people who came up with the Autistic Pride Day, it was one of their birthdays. It was the youngest member's birthday. Oh, so that's why they went with it. So there wasn't like a you know a stone wall, or there wasn't a commemorative like around Fairview Park or anything like that. There wasn't a commemorative thing that was going on. It just happened to be somebody's birthday. Yeah. So we were like. Oh, feck it then, we'll just move it. Um, so we were originally going to move it to be autistic pride. And then we were talking, we're like, well, none of us is just autistic. Like I'm autistic with ADHD, dyscalculia, 
dyspraxia, migraines, but there's a lot, there's a lot. You know, if you start listing off the things, you'd be here all day. But none of us were, and I have to be honest, I did, I only know a couple of people who identify as just autistic or just ADHD or just whatever. Um, and they tend to then, you know, go, oh, actually, while I'm here, I might as well, yeah. So, so we were like, well, why not? Because it's, we didn't do that to our community. We didn't silo off our community because we're not mon trying to monetize our community. We're not trying to be like, I'm an autism expert and here's pay me thousands of euros. Do you know what I mean? So we were like, why are we, why are we siloing? Why are we accepting this siloing off of our community when we don't do it ourselves? So we decided to do Neuropride and came up with the idea. And we looked into it and there wasn't really anything else like it in the world, to be honest with you. There is Fergus Murray, who's an amazing person and has been amazed in Scotland. He had done Weird Pride um, just previously. I mean, it had only been a small, it had been a relatively small thing, but he had started it. But other than that, we couldn't really find anybody else who'd done a festival. Yeah. So we decided, heck, we'll do a festival. And then, you know, we'll do a day. And then it turned into, we'll do a couple of days. Then it turned into a week long festival with like, I, I can't remember because Scalcula. I think we had 38 events. I'm not 100%. I'm not 100%. Do not quote me on that. But yeah, so, and we had six weeks to do it. And yeah, I wouldn't advise it. If anybody's thinking, oh, Jesus, what? no, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, and yeah. So this year you course, cut, cut away back and, and are doing less. Yeah, so we did five days and then we put on an extra festival for the weekend after. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, don't do what we do. Um, no, this is how not to do it. Uh, but it's, it's fantastic what you're doing. It really is. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Tell, so, what are you doing for the kids next week? Next weekend is it's only we're only going to have a few events. Like we're, it's not going to be a big to do. So on the Saturday at ten o'clock, I think it is. Um, there is an event bright link on our Facebook page. I'm really bad at this, telling people where to find information thing. Um. And your website as well, Neuropride Ireland. Um, on our website. It's on the website as well, if you look up under the events tab. But what it is, is that on te at 10 o'clock, we're going to be doing a story time. We're going to read books or stories from neurodivergent authors or, and aimed at neurodivergent children. Well, one yeah. of them is a story I wrote, so you'll just have to... Oh, you'll just have to give that... Like, yeah, no, be gentle with that one because it's not, it's not very good. But... um the and then we're having a craft kind of session after that and we will put up a list of things that people can do so it'll be crafts that people can follow along at home because it's all going to be on zoom um and then we have our dublin picnic so at the picnic there'll be coloring pages and different bits and bobs for kids probably bubbles because we all love bubbles things like that um and then on the sunday we're going to have a sensory story time and again we'll give people a list of here if you want to follow along you can do this and um god bloody ADHD is gone again as uh, so <laughs> yeah no and then we're going to have a Disney kind of music quiz kind of a thing okay. so yeah you can yeah it's yeah you can follow along like sort of name that music uh, Disney thing and then th and this is the thing that triggered this whole children's festival is that we were at the adult show and tell and everybody was showing their plushies and different bits and bobs from around their house and everything. And I text Kieran, I was like, kids would love this. Mm. Kids would love to come and show you their things. So yeah, so while we were hosting the <laughs> while we were hosting the Zoom, we were busy planning another thing. And um and Kieran was like, Oh, I've got the event event bright done up and blah blah blah. So yeah. But yeah, so it's a kids show and tell. So kids can bring now obviously we will have to limit it a little bit, be like, okay. Could have cut you off there. <laughs> it's gone on three days. days but kids, yeah. uh, here's we'll my answer. <laughs> so the limit for Zoom turns out to be, yeah. Um, so yeah, and it's just a little event for kids to come along and do it. Now, parents would have to be, or a guardian or an adult. Children have to have an adult. Adults have to have a children. So it's, you know, it's kind of like that. But uh, yeah, hopefully. And I know we are very aware that Zoom doesn't work for a lot of neurodivergent kids but it's it's just a space we don't 
they don't need to interact in yeah. any way, shape, or form. They don't even have to camera on or anything like that. It's just a space for them to kind of. Yeah, that's cool and very much needed. And I love it. I love that kids are being introduced to neuro pride now. You know, because I'll get them while they're young. Yeah, I hear. Yeah, what yeah, saying. totally. <laughs> like neuro shame. You know, so um, you yeah. know, talking about that, what you know. Why is there the need for maybe people who are kind of logging on to this today and don't know anything about the autistic community? You know, why is there a need for us to be organizing things like autistic pride and neuro pride in the first place? You know, well, we are a very stigmatized, very marginalized grouping. Um, the language used about us is very dehumanizing. It's like, for example, and it's like a lot of microaggressions, like it's not, people might, you don't even realize the way that you talk about us a lot of the time. Um, I remember doing a course in autism studies um, in a well-known university that I won't name. Uh, and the lecturer constantly, and this is not the only time this has happened to me in training because I'm an early childhood educator. So I've had to sit through a lot of pretty ableist training um, and, constantly referred to autistic people as they they do that they do this they do everything they were not getting into the fact that she was absolutely wrong by about most of the stuff that she was talking about but it was all they 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 and then the icing on the cake was and I bear in mind that we were a room full of teachers and early childhood educators the icing on the cake was that she told them if they wanted to learn about autism that they should watch third rock from the sun Mr. Bean what? and the IT. Oh, no, not, no. What's that one with Sheldon Cooper? Yeah. Um, Big Bang Theory. Bang. And I was like, oh. so actual aliens? Is that your suggestion? That people should watch, learn about autism by watching a program about actual aliens? Yeah. That's so, yeah. And the assumption that, like, no one in the room could be autistic. Oh, no, but that's, that, and that has happened to me on multiple occasions. And you're kind of sitting there going, so do I out myself? Do I say, oh, by the way, and I have on occasions yeah. said, ah, do you know what I mean? I, actually, you're wrong. And especially when they were talking about the likes of ABA or as the gold standard. And I'm like, sorry, I'm actually just going to stop you there. So, but it's hard. It's extremely hard for me to do because I have a lot of social anxiety. And so to do that takes an enormous amount. Yeah. Of, you know, I, oh, you should see me a shake. I'm absolutely I, a shake like that. I um. Particularly yeah, so. in that situation, because you're not the one in power. Like, it's fine for us talking here, you know what I mean? We're yeah, all yeah. equal power, but like in that situation. And, you and I think that's the thing. I think that a lot of autistic and other neurodivergent people, particularly autistic people, we have very little social power in a group setting. We have very little social power. We get talked over a lot in group settings. We get ignored. You'll be halfway through talking and you realize everybody else has started to listen to somebody else. We don't have that social power. Um, it comes back to that research in thin size judgments around um, geez, your man's name gone out of my head but there was research done that showed that a neuro neurotypical people will make a judgment about an autistic person within six seconds of meeting them and more often than not that's a very negative judgment so and we all as autistic people we all know what that feels like we all know the look we all know the, I can't even put it in words, that sense that this other person has dismissed you or has decided that you're not, you have no social cachet, you have no social power and has just decided not to listen to you anymore. And it's all those little things. I am very aware of my privilege as an autistic person of being a white cishet appearing person. I'm not, but I appear to be. Uh, I'm presenting do you know what I mean so I'm aware of my privilege and I am aware of my ability to mask and but that was hard to come by I started masking at a very very young age and it did me you know as Jude was talking about social skills training and everything I self ABA'd I taught myself that all the things I was an extraordinarily quiet child like the no hassle because you wouldn't even know she was there type of child. And I watched and I observed and I saw all the ways that I wasn't the same. And I taught myself to be the same. And it it destroyed me. It absolutely destroyed me. So 
that's why we need it because I don't want I don't want young autistic people thinking that that's what they have to do to be accepted I don't want it and I think that's what people don't understand is that like what I do this isn't about me but neuropoid we do a lot of background work on advocacy we do a lot of background like supporting parents and supporting educa other educators and stuff like that and we are planning to branch out more because this is my little baby but I don't think you understand why we're doing it like we it's traumatizing it's extremely triggering yeah. to go into spaces and hear people talk about us the way when you're talking about your child yes that's how you would have talked about us like do you know what I mean I'm not talking about like I think people don't understand that it takes an emotional toll to do this work it takes a lot of emotional energy from people who already are traumatized um so and they were willing to do it and I don't mean any offense by this I'm happy I will help any parent I will have any educator who wants help but I'm not doing it for you I'm not doing it for you I'm doing it for your child I'm doing it so no child has to grow up feeling the way we did um so yeah so that's an enormous part of it but the pride part of it, the neuro pride, that's for us. That's for the adults who weren't, who were late identified. That's for the adults who did have to grow up feeling really, really odd and really weird and really the odd ones out. And I'm not saying early diagnosed people didn't feel like that as well, but at least they knew what it was. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or yeah. they had some idea what was going on. Um, so that the pride part of it was for us was everybody keeps on telling us that we should be ashamed. Everybody keeps on telling us that this is stigmatized. And this is, like you said, telling somebody the first time that you're autistic, it, it, it does. Even if you're as happy as a clam being autistic, it's still that, that bit yeah. inside you. Um, and the when do I tell them? Not? It's, yeah. it is, it's a, it's a big deal. Like, um, and so for us, it was that kind of feeling of, we need a space where we can be just be proud of who we are and what we are like yeah. the rest of society like i wanted to just mention Anne memot if that's okay Anne memot is uh she's a woman from england uh and she one of the things she does on twitter if you ever follow, if you go and follow her amazing. on twitter she's amazing she's absolutely amazing fairness uh she takes all the research she reads all the research so we don't have to basically but she reads a lot of the research and kind of breaks it down and looks at it and says what it says and there's just one here like I just she has a blog and she goes by year and like this is a piece of research that came out in June of this year and the way that it talks about autistic people no not autistic people uh, ASD cases is how we were referred to we weren't even people and people were parents of ASD cases like listen to that language in 2022, when we have done, we have been working on this neurodiversity paradigm, we've been like tireless uh, neurodivergent people around the globe have been working and pouring their heart into going, hang on, we're here, we're, you know, we have a thriving community, please listen to us. And this is research that got funding and it's like, yep, yeah, there you go. It's, and that's the thing, we still face that prejudice all the time. And it's, it can wear you down it can wear you down so we needed a space where you know we can celebrate because there's so many amazing things about the neurodivergent community it's one of the most supportive communities that i've been a part of do you know what i mean so yeah i i'm 100 percent aware that i've kind of wandered away from the point completely no, you haven't i think you've, been, you've 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 said a lot of important things there and and, it, and that's the thing because i see there's not just with our community i see it with like uh, gay pride people going mm. But you don't see straight people having parades and i'm like yeah straight people weren't burnt at stakes and <laughs> you know sent down to institutions and it's like yeah. people don't know the history of it they just don't know they just see the and i think kind of i think the people attention. don't know i think the people don't aren't aware of that they're like of privilege to be well. horrible but like google the disability day of mourning if you want to know why we have neuropride i'm not going to get into it now because it's quite distressing Look at the statistics around restraint and seclusion. Um, now you'll find it hard to find statistics on that in Ireland because we don't measure it, but it does happen here. Um, 
look at those things. These are things that are still happening now. This isn't the dim and distant past. These are things that are happening to children in our country right now. So, and I really want to make the point that this isn't being proud necessarily of being neurodivergent or being autistic because that's an inherent integral part of me. It, it informs every sense. It informs every, my sense of the world. It informs my sense of myself. It'd be like being proud of, as I said before, being proud of having brown eyes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was born with brown eyes. I was born autistic and ADHD and all the rest of it. It's pride in being a member of a community that is standing up and going, we're here. We're, we're here. We are worthy. And having that pride in my own self-worth. Because um, I think it was Nick Walker, Dr. Nick Walker, I think she said that kind of, that sense of self-realization uh, or self-pride is the ultimate form of rebellion. And it is. It's the ultimate form of rebellion against a society that keeps on telling you that you should be ashamed of who you are. So it's that sense of pride. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, I was reading something today uh, about creativity and it was just about honoring yourself. And obviously we're doing this evening and I was kind of going, that's what it is to me. You know, it's that kind of, you're just honoring who you are. You know, mm. you're, you're, this is, we're entitled to take up the space in this world, basically, that people are mm. telling us we, we aren't. Um, yeah. I think that's how I, I kind of interpret it. Um, because, and I mean, I started using the word prejudice because I wish that word was there, you know, eight years ago when I started reading things. It wasn't really. Mm -hmm. People talk about ableism, which obviously is the same thing, but doesn't compute, I think, people don't like. I didn't know yeah, what ableism yeah. It took me a few years to actually, I was like, what is ableism? Because I just saw people calling things ableism, but not actually kind of seeing, and also not seeing the ableism and stuff because of my own, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I'm picky at all, but yeah, it's, um, it is yeah, and, and that trick pin slice judgment that you, you know, research that mm -hmm. you mentioned, like if somebody makes a snap judgment within milliseconds of meeting you, doesn't matter what, what you are, who you are, what skills you have, that is prejudice. Like, you know what mm. I mean? We can call it pin slice ju judgments or we can call it's it- prejudice, no, it's prejudice. That is literally a definition of prejudice. Someone who doesn't know you is making assumptions about you and doesn't want to get to know you, you know? Yeah. Like, it's like, it's like if I can tell a little anecdote. Um, I went to, to a gig with a couple of people that I like, one of them was a friend and then it was two of her friends. So I didn't really know them that well. I knew them, but I didn't know them that well. We went up to a gig and I don't know how they started talking about Bob Dylan. And they started talking about him and they were saying, you know, that he, that he wasn't a particularly nice person in, in like from reading his biography and stuff like that. And some of the stuff that they read, they were like, geez, he was a bit blah, blah, blah. And they started going on, oh yeah, but he was probably autistic. Like They'd listed all this misogynistic, not nice behavior. And then they're straight away were like, uh, oh, that's he's probably autistic. I don't know. I don't know if Bob Dylan has ever said that he was, wasn't, or I think that's not the point. The point is, is that they listed these very negative uh, characteristics or traits and went, oh, that's because he, that, he must be autistic. And I was like, I was just like, standing there going, what the feck do I say now? So I went, um, sorry, do you mind? And they went, what? And I said, I'm autistic. And they said, oh, but not you. We like you. We like your, your type. And I was like, are you actually joking right now? So you like don't know. One. Like, but the thing is, you like my nice. version of me that I've shown you. If I was standing here hand flapping, would you like me as much? If I was having a meltdown, would you like me as much? Or is it only that I'm a socially acceptable autistic person? Like, the thing is, is that I, this is, this is a struggle that I really struggle with, is that I am very hyper aware of the fact that I have privilege in this community. I am not a traveler. I am not black. I am not, I don't have an intellectual disability. I do not, I sometimes struggle to speak, but I'm not a praxic. I don't have anything else that like that makes the means I have. I have um, situational mutism, but I have learned to overcome it a bit more as an adult. When I was a child, I definitely did. I was, I was called sly because I was so quiet. But the thing is, is that I'm very aware of that. And it's very difficult. It's a high, hard dichotomy. And you probably find it yourself, Evelyn, of do I speak out? But how do you speak out without speaking over? Do you know what I mean? And it's, but what do we do? So we, in Neuropride, 
that was part of it as well, is creating these spaces to let, to help people, to nourish people who mightn't be ready to go on a Zoom or go on a webinar or whatever, but to help them have a space where they could talk about things. They yeah. could talk with their peers. So they didn't have to worry and about that, all that this. That space is so, so, so important, you know, because I suppose I kind of went out there with my Facebook page and everything like, I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared, you know. I was lucky mm. that I met people in the community who are, you know, <laughs> not keeping one in there, you know, um, who were supportive of me, you know what I mean? And, and I needed that because I was still figuring things out for myself. I'm still figuring things out. You know, we will we'll always be figuring things out. And I think mm. that space is just so, so important. Like, mm. and it's brilliant that you've created it. And like, it's been, people are watching it. You have a community, like you have your public Facebook page mm. and a website, but you also have Nora Pride community, which is like a group on Facebook. And like, to be honest, it's probably like the only group I've lasted in. There's a few other ones. <laughs> you know, it's just really well run. It's really nice. It's a really, it is like, it's a really friendly, supportive place. Um, and I think everyone there kind of respects each other and, you know, as well. And it's lovely to see, you know, the amount of kind of people meeting up now and offline and things like that as well. Yeah. Like, there's just so and we have like, we've, from it. it's, it's yeah, beautiful. we've, we've expanded it to Discord. You know, don't ask me about Discord because I'm absolutely yeah. useless. I'm basically not allowed near anything because I keep on breaking them. But um, but the Discord uh, community has really grown as well. And it's great. And that we do have a kind of more public facing part. Like, so you can join our Discord and you can be there as an ally and we'll share resources and research and stuff like that. Um, but there's also the community side and it's linked, like, and it's broken down into, you know, interest and headings and more general chat and everything. And that's really vibrant. And we only started that, I'd say about two months ago. And it's a really vibrant thing. Because, you know, for the young folks, I'm too old for this. Yeah, I'm too old to But, uh, but yeah, like the thing is, is that it is a supportive place. But we, as the admins, we're very light touch. We don't go in yeah. and go, oh, actually, you can't do that. No, sorry, sorry. You can't say that and everything. Because we haven't had to. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. If somebody was problematic, if somebody said something really offensive or anything like that. We oh, would and address Derek, it. is that? Yeah. Derek is asking a good question actually because uh, it's neuro pride so can people who are not autistic join this Facebook group so if they identify yeah. as neurodivergent um, yeah. if you go onto our website we have a little thing about am I neurodivergent enough for neuro pride we take a very like I know that and it's about that monetization as well that that commercialization that over I've only noticed that over the last couple of years there's become this that neurodiversity has become a synonym for autism that's not what it's about yeah that's not neurodiversity does not mean no autistic and possibly ADHD yeah. that's not what it's about and it's not about we're not doing this to make ourselves more employable either it'd be nice to have a job but don't worry about it the thing is is that neurodiversity for us means any neurotype that falls without or outside, sorry, the neuromajority. Yeah. So we would, let's, like your big ones, your big ones, your autistic, ADHD, but we're all OCD, BT, BPD, why do I struggle with that one so much? Tourette's, um, uh, Down syndrome, not everybody who's who has Down syndrome identifies as neurodivergent, but they may do. Intellectual disabilities, anxiety, migraine, like we, um, when I say we take a broad, yeah. We use a broad brush. We use a broad brush because would, you we're not here to police. Who doesn't fit in? To be honest, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, pretty much everybody in the world could fit in at some point, but not everybody. Like like the disabled community, not everybody who could be part of that community identifies part. You can't police people like that. But yeah, and that's another thing that part of the whole neuropride thing is also building on that idea from the disabled community and their dis disability power and disability pride. So we were linked in with all those kind of communities or, and movements and stuff like that. So a lot of what we do as well in the background is advocacy work. Like we have put in submissions to the Oireachtas. I've spoken to the Oireachtas Committee on the UN CRPD. And- No, so, it is like, uh, I don't like it. A lot of work yeah. in the past, but uh, yeah, needed to be yeah. done. So I was speaking and on behalf of a group. I wasn't just on my own, just so you know. Yeah, I know, but, but like you did it for our communities. Thank you, yeah. as we're here. So, 
but like so there is a lot of graciously <laughs> yeah but yeah but like even like last year for as part of our festival we did educational videos and very like it was amazing a load of members of our community came forward people who you know the people affected came forward and did videos on their neurodivergence or some aspect of neurodivergence that within the community we have very good understanding and awareness of but this information isn't being passed to parents and educators like and it's like well if you don't know what introception is you're not going to know that has that what a role that has in the likes of self-regulation and stuff like that or why your child is struggling to know when they need to go to the toilet or like me I don't feel thirst thirst I don't drink I like unless somebody comes up and hands me stuff, something to drink I'll forget to drink for and people think oh you couldn't possibly I think I feel thirst maybe three times a year that's how infrequently I feel thirst and um, so do you know what I mean if you don't have that word how are you going to find out any of that information yeah or proprioception or you know like, I'm oh, I'm rattling off words I'm rattling off words here that we know what all word. this means so, you know yeah. like sensitive sensitivity reject Jesus rejection sensitivity you know what I mean it's rejection like, sensitivity it's just, yeah, yeah yeah it just gives you um it gives yeah. you the language to explain things to other people as well. I mean, that's what I find a lot of time. Like, yeah. that's how I explain that thing, or that's how I understand it. Like, because it is a, oh, it, it is like learning a whole load, like new. Yeah, and path. especially for people who are late identified or late, um, coming to an awareness of, oh, this is why I had, this is why I've struggled with this. This is why this has been difficult for me. Yeah, I think it very much ties into self acceptance because. Oh. So we eternalize everything we constantly think if we're struggling with something it's like well it's a me fault and we've been given that message I think especially people with ADHD have been given that message from a very early age so it's formed your core belief about yourself yeah you are wrong like I'm you know in any social interaction I'm always going to assume that it was me that messed it up I've got better now I'm going no hang on you didn't but my initial reaction or mission was like oh yeah I don't know how you did it but in some way it was you that did that and um, so yeah and I think finding out about something like rejection sensitivity for you or I, I do not like the term pathological demand avoidance but I am very demand avoidant oh, I'm finding know. out yeah I'm finding out oh that's why I get like the second somebody says something to me do you know what you should do I'm like right well I'll never do that it doesn't matter if I wanted to do it or not I won't but so but it's quite frustrating because I'm yeah. demanding one to myself as well like but I'm sure. to tell myself to do something so but if you yeah. know you can kind of overcome some of your things as well because you're like are you just being are you just being demand void now just, yes you know. I know give myself <laughs> time there was a project came up recently and I was like am I not doing this because I'm afraid to do it you know is it like a demand yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do I really not have the time? And I gave myself like a week to figure that out. And I was like, no, I actually just don't have the That's time. That's it. And I give myself processing time there. Whereas yeah. before I would have felt pressured to people please and answer straight yeah, away. I've and done it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. And overstretch yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, we actually have a rule in Neuropride in the organizers, the four of us, that because three of us are autistic with ADHD, so we'll agree to everything. Um, oh yes, let's do all the things. Shiny, shiny, shiny. Um so we have a rule that we'll agree to things, but you have 48 hours to back out of it. No questions asked. You Good can just say, yeah. Down it. Um, and unfortunately, most of the time we don't use it because we, you know, we're just like, oh, no, let's still, let's still do everything. But it's there and we just have that as an ingrained and no questions asked. Nobody's going to be like, but you said you'd do it. How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah you've obviously realized you don't have the spoons for this far away because we do oh, yeah. kind of live off our emotions and our excitement and like like oh that sounds amazing it will be amazing it has to happen and then we just go do dopamine. it dopamine yeah it's a hell of a oh, <laughs> and like, why did i why did i put myself through all that but then you had this really good thing at the end of it you know what i mean or whatever the process is good too sometimes yeah. um yeah um but it was Shar said there was it Shar had a comment about uh so true knowledge is everything half knowing something is so dangerous and that is such a big problem. Half knowing that the information that I get back, say, like at training sessions, I, like that they've heard from other people, I'm like, oh, like that's not even that. Like, even, do you know what? Did I, what did oh, no, Evelyn, I step in here. Defined as something recently. And I was going, 
it wasn't proprioception. It was literally like another thing that they had just described to find cover what it was now. Evelyn, can I tell you what I heard? This now, this is a go, this is a doozy. This is a doozy. So again, back to that course that I was doing that was in a college that prides itself on its autism course. And they were going, it was an initial lecture and they were talking about the history and blah, blah, blah. And they just presented Canner, didn't, no, no critique of, it was only eight white children. No, no critique of any of it. It was just like, here's Canner and here's Asperger and whatever. And then we got to causes of autism. I was like, oh Jesus, here we go. And one of the causes, this, this lecturer, now bearing in mind, this was a level nine. This was a module for a master's. This wasn't, you know, not that I'm trying to be hierarchical about it, but this was a level nine master's you course. A certain standard of that, yeah. Hmm. So this person, this lecturer said, one of the causes of autism is theory of mind. Not lack of theory of mind, rather theory of mind. Oh, and I was like, look, I am no fan of Simon Baron Cohen, but even he didn't say that. <laughs> like, give is, the man a break. Yeah, yeah. this is, that's, well, it's that kind of, it's like, Never mind, like the bad stuff. Like we need social skills training. This yeah. is just like people getting the bad information wrong. Like yeah. it's, like, it's like, wait a minute. This is actually like another step further. This is right. the your mind. This is <laughs> like, and that's I'm the like, thing. This is the person who's lecturing in it, and who thinks that they're an expert. And you're like, but a quick Google would have told you you were wrong. Do you know what I mean? And um, so, yes, I have to be honest. When I hear somebody self-describe as an autism expert, I'm on edge yeah. because I've very rarely heard an autistic person describe themselves as an autism expert because we are very aware that I'm an expert about mine, yeah. but that's about it. I can tell well, you theories and I can tell you, like, you know, I me mean, for research, but... I think saying, because I, 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 this has been used to gaslight autistics as well. It's kind of like, you're oh. just an expert on your experience. It's like, well, no, I can read books and I can talk yeah. to other autistic people. Yeah. And but no, and do you know what? So I just, that, yeah. No. yeah. Like, yeah. Actually, you're right. Because that whole thing, you know, that whole thing of you've met, when you've met one autistic person, you met one autistic, that's, that's rubbish. Like we have a community. And so I'm going to completely, completely go back on what I just said. But the thing is, is that, when I say I'm an expert on my, I'm aware of how yeah. my interoception affects me, but I know that interoception is a commonality with most nerd. Um, and because you have this thing called empathy, you can use ridiculous. your experience. We all know I have no empathy with <laughs> other people. So if this is what it feels like for me, then it must be something similar for someone who can't. You know, it's like it's not that hard. And like I suppose, but this, I mean. That's the no, thing. But there are. I do, do. Get, I do get that we all have different experiences, totally. And I'm like, but like, what I think, what I've started doing in the past, we've more in but common than we don't. We've othering ourselves as well. You know, I was kind of like, are we yeah. adding to this? You know, and, and I try, like, yeah. so I mean, now I really focus. I suppose we've always done it. And like, it's a lot of Mackie's influence, like, autistics are human. Mackie, you can join us if you want. Um, You know, autistics are human autistics are human I'm like yeah okay now I get it you know <laughs> two years after you know thinking about it's like this thing yeah I was saying that to somebody the other day and they were talking about autistic traits and blah 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 and I was like somebody I was about that everybody's a little bit autistic and it's like it, it's that thing it's like it's almost like they're human traits it's almost like we're human that's yeah. what it is yeah it's it maybe is. perhaps they were all a little bit human is that more accurate to say now, don't get me wrong, there are differences, like, with the way we perceive things in our sensory profile and stuff well, like that, but I'm not mean, saying that. The three but what, are, you'd never find three people the same anywhere, so it's kind of like, no. you look like when people go, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, and they use it like this quote, like, they know something about us, and I'm like, really? yeah, just like uh, other human beings. <laughs> when you've met almost one like person, individuals. you've yeah. met one person, and they're like, oh, oh yeah. But um, yeah, Joanna's saying we'd love to stop using the word autism altogether and, and change to autistic. Mackie says, mm. been autism and autistic alike. They're both utterly incorrect terms. Autistic arose to describe locked in their own world. See, that's mm. the thing. It's like, I don't like talking about autism at all, really, because we're talking about uh, medical diagnosis and listed deficits. That's what that is. Autistic is mm. kind of a word we've somehow reclaimed a bit from that. But like, 
autistic isn't right either. Mackie, what word would you use? Jillian, you can stay in the room. Where do you want to go? It's up to you. This is like, <laughs> this might go a bit pear shaped, guys. <laughs> it might just take a life of its own. Yay. <laughs> All good. Um, actually, two seconds, because Kat, Kat asked a question uh, ages ago, and I'm just going to answer it now. I'm curious to know how it is received in training when you tell them you're autistic. Did they listen? And um, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. yeah, like, I mean, how did it go for you, Gillian? And then maybe we, yeah. Um, do you know what? The person given the training did not respond well, but nobody likes to be told that, you know, that they're not doing things right. Like, she's <laughs> By the way, you're hundred percent wrong. Here I am, just a randomer. Um, well, actually, no, but I couldn't stay silent then because she was talking about ABA and literally that was the only thing that they talked about the module and we were it was part of my training as special ugh, anyway additional needs training um or just needs as they're better off now um but other people in my class my classmates one of them said it out in the class and said thank you for saying that my brother's autistic and I really appreciate you saying it and another another classmate another couple of classmates but one in particular came to me afterwards and spoke to me and asked me for some advice and her son ended up getting diagnosed the next year so even though it was a horrible I'm not going to lie to you it was horrible it was a horrible situation I felt so sick because I am such a little ruler bear and, and pushing back against the, the person in charge but um I'm really glad I did because because of that that other person felt seen and this other this other mother got the support that she needed for her child so yeah but no it wasn't received well um and there is times where I have kept my mouth shut because it it would make it even worse it would make a already difficult situation where I'm holding it together yeah even more for me so I have to make that call whether I have the and you the know mental capacity for it. I had a, a lovely teacher who did some training with me and then came back um, for a different course and uh, had gone to a training event and the, with autism was, you know, all throughout the training. And, you know, she said, actually, you know, autistic people prefer to be called autistic and was told, no, 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 we call them people with autism. And actually, it's not even us, it's actually like allies. People kind of say, yeah. so. You know, and I get it, nobody kind of likes being corrected in front of a group or whatever, but it's like, well, if you're giving out the information, then you've got to be ready to receive some too, I think. Um, Mackie, if we didn't use... I think, all though, what? What? Just, just from what Jilly was saying there, one thing I've... And it's a, a lesson which it took me a very, very long time to learn um, and an awful lot of pain to get there. But um, when you're saying something like that and you're, you've got to... Well, you don't usually have the emotional wherewithal to actually plan it, but you got to remember who the audience is. Um, and in that situation, the lecturer wasn't the audience. The lecturer was your prop. Everyone else in the room was the audience. And you speaking out as a voice of dissent was exactly what was needed. Obviously, I mean, you've given examples of how well, it was positive, said, Maggie, but yeah. the fact that they respond negatively is part of your message. Mm. Because they're, exactly. you're, they're almost validating what you're saying. I mean, if, I mean essentially, you're going to say, look, um, you can't crap on people. Um, and the response is, what? You people? I'm going to crap on you. And everyone went, oh, yeah, I it's see exactly what's going on. But that's, that's one of the reasons I spoke out. And I did on that course that I was talking about as well. I because obviously this pretty forced socialization that I have to do about talking about other people's papers and stuff like that. I use that to give them information about conferences that were coming up to drop research links and do that. So that was my little act of rebellion. But in that case, I knew that my audience wasn't because here were people who were working in early childhood who were going to or train or trained to be SNAs. And I'm like, no, you can't go out into the world. I start working with autistic children thinking that this is that this is right so in that on that occasion i was able to push my past my my very big social phobia about talking about in public 
and which is ironic I know because we're on zoom but as you said I was aware I'm not talking to you and I don't actually care whether you react badly to this or not because it's more important that these people don't get this terrible information so yeah I'd agree with you that I knew I knew at that occasion that that wasn't my audience yeah yeah took me a long while to figure that out you you know you're going to do that thing where i'm going to go i'm going to fight these people on social media and everything they say i'm going to go and push back and get caught up in these relentless long uh, battles pointless word wars it's only when you realize they're they were never the audience that you think do you know what not only do you actually get better at directing the right message in the right place but the emotional burden it creates yeah. falls right down you know because what they say in response just washes over you because they were irrelevant to it anyway you weren't even talking to them they're just some noise in the background you know and it just gets an awful lot easier <laughs> when you do it like that and um, because their words don't hurt so much when they come back at you you know um so on that yeah it is say it's interesting it's really interesting i trying to make a getaway i've kept her long enough i'm trying to get out of here mackie stop I talking know, to yeah. me <laughs> stop interrupting <laughs> so, uh, you're very young you're mean, really I mean, probably exhausted like you've put so much work in the last i hope you get a bit of rest now in the next few days before you do the kids thing um and thank you for I'm going to a wedding you want to you audience as well <laughs> joanna thank you for organizing her project. like it's amazing just brilliant yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a million. Thanks for bye, me. bye. Bye-bye. Mackie, right. Your turn on your own. This is great. So um, myself and Mackie usually like do, you know, formal webinars and courses. We've spent the last few months putting slides and videos and all sorts of things together for training. It's lovely to have a chance to actually just kind of have a rant. Uh, <laughs> just have a chat. Isn't it? Well, I've actually prepared, I've actually prepared a script here, which I'd like to read out. <clears throat> Yeah. Now, I mean, you, you know me well enough to know that, like, um, it's a dangerous thing to give me a platform without um, something really specific. Yeah. <laughs> because even with something really specific, I'll go right, off. I'm going to give you something specific. Um, uh, tell me what pride means to you without crying. Ah! <laughs> without getting emotional. No, no I'm joking. Pride is... <laughs> The funny thing about pride is that um, I, this because I mean, this is something every time anyone uses the word pride in relation to any marginalized group, you, the the response is always going to like, look at you. What do you mean by pride? And I mean, people have already talked about like what pride really means. But um, being the kind of word nerd that I am, um, the first thing I do is I go for to, straight to kind of. Um, etymological dictionaries and translations and all the rest of it in trying to find, you know, what's what underlies the word? Where's its origins? Where does it come from? And all the rest of it. Um, but if you actually look at the word shame and you look at the word pride, the two of them are essentially the opposites to each other, you know? Uh, the interesting thing, and I like to do this sometimes, is, is just say, what's the antonym? What's the opposite word for this? So you put in um, pride and say, okay, give me antonyms. And shame comes up pretty much straight away as one of the first options. So and it kept coming up. I tried it several different places. Kept coming up. I said, okay, shame. Shame's an important word. Let's take shame and do that. So I said, okay, what comes back when you, when you put shame in? Say, give me the antonyms for shame. The words that came back, I was surprised by it because I've been harping on about this stuff forever, um, were honor, dignity, respect, and pride. And I went, cool. I like that. Let's try another place. Let's try another same. They kept coming back with the same words. And when you think about pride, you have to think about pride as one of those words that goes together. They, they're, they're like a they're like a, um, a club, okay? They're kind of like um, Westlife, you know, they all go together. <laughs> they're kind of a set. Um, so yeah, pride, dignity, honor, and respect. I mean, those are the words that people don't use very much when we use pride, but I mean, dignity, honor, and respect, they all sound very old fashioned. 
Well, you know? dignity is your one. You use dignity a lot. Like you use dignity. I use dignity a lot. And the one that I, I want to use is honor and honorable. It's funny, but that came up in a book. People, the, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because people don't get where I'm coming from when I say it, that. It actually, that word, like honor, because again, it's not a word that's used very often, but like nowadays. <laughs> but you know the book I was reading today about like it was creativity and honoring yourself and blah 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 and I was like honoring that's the word like that 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 is actually we don't honor people like because it's taken on that kind of fake praise give someone an award have a big thing about it that's how we honor things rather than kind of like in a humble way in a in like really what that word means you know what I mean kind of like treating something as precious it's kind of how I would see. Yeah. I mean, the thing that gets me about all of those words is that part of the process of de- those things happening, um, feeling pride in something, yeah. um, honoring something, respecting something, having dignity in yourself, is that just before them, there's this little pause where there's a point of realization where you say, this deserves to be honored. This de- is something worthy of respect. This is something to be proud of. And then you say, I'm going to do that. And it's that little switch. That's what matters about them. The fact that you actually, you know, I'm going to step out of like the, the, the high speed flow of life. I've been stopped in my tracks by something here and I need to act on that. Um, and there, I mean, going back to the word respect, they're terribly respectful things to do when you think about it, isn't it? Um, For yourself or for other people or for a group of people or for an idea or whatever it might be, to honour it and respect it um, and to feel proud of something. You know, there's as words, they kind of overlap. They've got a good 20% overlap between them all, you know, and that's where they all kind of go together. They're all kind of stuck together with a bit of, sellotape or something autistic sellotape <laughs> but yeah i mean I, I, yeah i mean I've, i'm a word nerd so like i mean i kind of get ridiculous about this stuff but as a bunch them together and get a fuzzy sense of those kinds of things that's what it's about that's yeah. what it's about it's about pausing for a moment and saying do you know what this deserves a little bit of my time yeah 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 I suppose it, yeah, I'm just thinking, it, it doesn't matter. There's no point me saying what's in my head. Um, <laughs> go somewhere else. Um, okay, and then I asked you this earlier, actually. I think it's, it, it's like, for people, what would you say to autistic people or other neurodivergent people, this is neuropride, who are, you know, struggling with that, which lots of autistic people do, you know, we, we, we see it all the time, people who kind of haven't accepted themselves, um, kind of think a lot of this trauma and side effects of that trauma or, or whatever, you know, is autism, you know, people who think other people treating them badly was justified because of their behavior. Um, you know, people who, aren't not only are they not proud of their autistic identity they're kind of like not okay with themselves you know what i mean so kind of how do what would you say to somebody maybe struggling to feel the way we do about who we are uh, now <laughs> at this stage in our lives and it takes constant work um what would you say to somebody who's, who's been on that journey it's honestly i think it's actually I mean, there's ways to come up with kind of nice answers to that, but honestly, it is one of those points where you need to think quite seriously um, about that person and where they are. Because um, if somebody's feeling like that, it means they're not just an individual in isolation with um, a point of view. They're x number of years old and they have had that many years of using the word i started using recently sedimentation this kind of build up of sediment um so and you know they have a context they have a social context they have experiences and all those things they haven't come to this 
sense of shame, which is essentially what you're talking about, just yeah, because I went, yeah, it's not on TV. I think I'll feel shame, you know, and that's been driven by something. And that, I mean, you could have quoted it there, I think earlier on was um, all autistics are human. That there was a sequence there, which um, when I wrote it, it, it went, all autistics are human. Nobody does anything without a reason. All reasons are valid. And it was it was that sequence. There's a, a logic within that. And when you actually take those and step back through them, what you end up with is um, whatever that person is doing, even if it's feeling shame, they're doing it because that's the best option that they felt that they had at that point in time. Um, and what would I say to them? I would be very careful, I think. I'll be very careful because what's necessary in that situation is another one of those unpopular words, which is compassion. And another one, which is really unpopular, which is patience. Um, and again, those are two words that kind of go hand in hand. These are, I mean, I'm a big fan of unpopular words. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about, um, Pride and Prejudice, which is, you know, Jane Austen. We're going back 200 years there straight away. So, I mean, this, I, this is my excuse for using old words. Um, <laughs> An extra layer to the theme. Yeah, the compassion and patience tread gently um, because that person has reasons for feeling shame. And you don't unravel shame just by saying, oh, you shouldn't feel shame. You should feel blah, blah, blah. Because, like, I mean, it's not a little switch. It's a complex mess of stuff that needs to be carefully unraveled. I mean, you know yourself, like, I mean, we've all done it. The whole process of going through, okay, this is wrong. I don't like this. I need to do things differently. What are we going to do here? How am I going to, and you have to disentangle yourself out of a mindset. Um, and the thing is, the mindset's tied into so many other things in your life even like down to your personal relationships yeah um it's not an easy thing to do so being gentle with people i think is is however you do it whatever word you use i think gentleness is uh, an important <laughs> aspect of all of that somewhere along the line um it and it's too easy especially with social media it's way too easy to just um language police people and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, that's just making it worse. You know, that's the opposite of community. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, sure, we are all guilty of being language police at some point. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You know, you don't, you don't get to be a word nerd without language, language, language policing somebody at some point in your life. <laughs> yeah. Just, um, you know, and it's just, I think, I think it's just, yeah. It's kind of personal growth as well, and just kind of being new to community and, and, and kind of going, Oh, this is what we have to do, you know, kind of following these rules, you know, too. But also, um, it's sometimes that kind of stuff, you know, certain language doesn't matter. Like, you know, I went to, you know, I was giving a talk um, to parents on anxiety, on uh, these kids like had, you know, left school or, you know, kind of threatening to leave school at this stage. And didn't matter if they were saying with autism or autistic, they really didn't, you know what I mean? When you're talking about kids who are, you know, that distressed, that's what I was there to talk about. That's what needed, you know, so it's mm. kind of, but like, yeah, it just depends. Like, and then obviously if you're in a room with people who are hurting and their children are hurting, you're so aware of that. Whereas online, you're kind of not really, you know what I mean? It's just like words and things. Um, we have some, some questions there. Um, this is anonymous. How can you tell if you're masking? Ooh, good question. I did not know I was masking for a long time. How can uh, how can you know if it if it began without you even realizing it in the first place? I mean, that would have been my scenario. I wouldn't have known I was masking. I didn't know what masking yeah. was. I suppose until I kind of started demasking. If that makes sense, you know what I mean. It was only when I started to be more myself that I kind of realized. How, like it's so alien for me now to think of how I used to act and how I used to think like eight years ago even five years ago because I think it was a gradual kind of thing that happened over a few years 
um, it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have realized I was doing it. But no, retrospectively, I can just like see how much masking I was doing. Are there kind of tell signs, Mackie? Is there something you can, because it's a really good question. It's something I haven't kind of, you know, <sighs> in my head already. Um, is there, how would it's you so, do masking? I suppose it's when you're exhausted. It's when you're, I suppose, yeah. you're alert. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's the it's when when doing when you are doing things that are actually when you look at them you know that they're ordinary things they're mundane things but you, they are burning you up ten times faster than anybody else you like socializing and stuff like that and so goes oh my god I'm so glad it's over I'm so exhausted blah 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 blah. And then you start chit-chatting about other stuff, and you're like, no, you're not. <laughs> you have no idea. I want to curl up in a ball in, in a dark space for two days now. That's exhausted. <laughs> um, it's when you can see that it's eating you far more than the people around you. It's a pretty good sign. You know? Yes. And it does eat you. Analyzing everything. Like that was a massive thing for me, you know, in, 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 if I having a conversation with someone, analyzing things as it was happening, then walking away, running through what happened, all oh, the deep shame, you know, like Jillian said, this was, nothing might have even gone wrong, but just feeling like something was wrong anyway, that horrible feeling, uh, giving out to yourself, right, what will I learn from this, what will be better the next time, you know, um, being very hard on yourself, I think, actually, because that's what you're doing, really, yeah. that's why you're hard, because you're kind of, trying to teach her, you've given out to herself. Like someone said that recently, it was Harry actually yeah. Thompson when we did the, the webinar recently, you know, Gillian said it there, it's like she ABA'd herself. That's kind of what Harry said as well. And it was like, and we're the worst therapists because we're like so critical, you know? Like what we say- That's the thing, I mean, that's- Nobody else I mean, I was talking to you a while back about um, shame because I, it's one of those words that kind of came into my consciousness there. Um, particularly earlier on this year, it kind, of, it kind of came into focus. Um, the idea of shame and the insidious way that shame works. And that's essentially what masking is. It's, it's the side product of a sense of shame. And what shame does is, is it's you getting the sense from other people that you're disapproved of as you ordinarily are. And that you're under an obligation to do something else in order to please them. And you carry that around with you. That's the thing about shame is when those people are gone away, you're sitting in a room on your own, it's still with you. And you're still thinking about it. Um, and part and parcel of, of I think, of, of masking isn't the time you spend out with other people, interacting with them with the mask gone. It's the amount of time you're spending when you're not with other people that you're devoting your time to planning your next masking session, analyzing the last masking session, analyzing that one five years ago yeah. at one time, a 15 oh. second interaction. And you have been lying here in bed for two hours, tormented by it. Um, over and over this stupid thing. And yeah. About, about like I said, the seconds you spent interacting with somebody who, if you walked up to them in the street now and introduced yourself to them, they would probably not even know who you were. Yes. And yet it's still tearing you up. Because for me, a lot of the time, if, when you're masking and paying so much attention to what you do, you kind of forget that other people aren't. Like you kind of presume that everyone's watching what you're doing too and they're being hyped. Yeah. Nobody gives a damn. <laughs> they're not. I mean, that for me was like, actually, no one really cares. No one is following your journey. Do you know what I mean? No one's yeah. reading this monologue in your head, this novel you're writing about yourself. No one's reading it, Evelyn. So just throw it out. I think there's, there's, you were talking about what kind of a piece of advice would you give to people. Probably the most important piece of advice you can give to somebody who is dealing with um, that shame, self disgust, uh, masking anxiety kind of complex is nobody cares nobody cares about you nobody gives a damn they really don't they might criticize you but five seconds later they've forgotten 
you know, actually, it just came out. They, you did something and they went, Bleh! thoughtless response, and they move on. You don't matter in the eyes of other people. And if you don't matter, it doesn't matter. The interaction doesn't matter. Um, and you actually think about some of the most confident people that you see around you. You know, those people who kind of like bounce into the room and they're kind of high five and people as they go past and name checking people and chatting with people. They just come up and they just start talking to someone and people are glad to be talking to them. They're so bursting with that kind of personality and confidence stuff. Um, how many of those people have you come across who quite regularly come out with something pretty appalling? That if you were to just write it down on a piece of paper, you'd think, mm, no, you can't. That's not, yeah, no. But because they do it with this kind of everything's fine, kind of panache, bravado kind of approach, it, people just roll through it and they almost laugh at it. And, and oh, look at it. What a scamp. <laughs> you know, the, no, actually, they were really bloody horrible. Like, you can't say that. If anyone else had said it, they'd have been called up on it it's that kind of thing um you can actually get away with an awful lot of stuff and um, making mistakes mistakes and um, saying the wrong thing having the wrong tone all the time you can get away with that stuff because people aren't really paying attention you know and i think yeah. one of the things is that from if you're on the inside as an autistic person you are hyper vigilant it's part and parcel of the deal and not because you're autistic but because of the way people treat you so you are hyper vigilant, which means that you pay attention to every tiny detail, even the tiny details that aren't even there, because they might be, and you might not have spotted them. So you're paying attention to the fact that they could be something that you didn't spot. <laughs> so now you're dealing with hypotheticals. Nobody else is doing this. Isn't that exhausting? Because nobody else is doing it. They don't remember. They don't care. Yeah. So and, chill like it. Um, somebody just asked what is masking and I just said it's uh, basically the response to trauma when you are not being yourself you're trying to please people and do everything perfectly I think that's probably just a brief um, mm. uh, there's just another question perfectionism is, a, is an important word in there though because you're trying to be perfect sense of, all the time trying, right? yeah awesome. trying to get just to be like the, the perfect person all the time all the time all the time yeah. um, and every time you're not and you're a human being you're not going to do this sorry like, um I remember having you kill yourself like, over it. And this is what I mean about like I forget sometimes what I used to be like. Um, like if my friend was calling to see me in my new house, whatever. And I know you know you'd want to have your house nice and someone's coming to see whatever. And but like she arrived early and I hadn't like made my bed properly, and I was like, oh, really annoyed that she was there early and I hadn't made the bed properly because I was going to show her in the house. This is like 10 years ago or something, more 15 years ago. And and now I'm like Oh my God, like my friend came to see me. I just like, come on in, it's grand, we chat. I'd make the bed while I'm talking to her. But it's that kind of thing. It's those little things where like, you get this, you get so upset about like things not being perfect, you know, because it's kind of like people will see you as being imperfect and you've learned already that you kind of are imper imperfect because that's what like, you know, that they're the responses you've got. That's kind of like what it's like. Um, me anyway. yeah so, if you have, I, I've, no, I think I've said this I've probably said this but two or three times because I usually repeat myself relentlessly um but the analogy with dancing it's like the people around you are um, up on a dance floor and they're dancing around and you're standing up on one of those little three-legged stools one of the big you know like a bar stool a big tall one and they're and you're not dancing and they're like Come on, come and dance. You're like, I'm up on this stool here. If I start dancing, I have to be super careful because the slightest error and I come tumbling down. You know, and they don't see the fact that you're standing on a stool. They just see you as there. Why aren't you doing what we do? Is you're desperately trying to dance like everyone else, but also not fall off. So you, you're trying to do like about four times as much work as everyone else. They're just putting the effort into not falling over and having fun. You're trying to look like you're not falling over, look like you're not, you're look like you're having fun and not falling over and watching what everyone else is doing and thinking about what, how you're coming across and what could come next and how are you going to plan your words for all those things in your head. And um, that's an awful lot of work. Guess why people feel tired? 
Yeah, I'm just going to say, no wonder, social, no, no wonder we get social hangovers. Of course, it's exhausting. Um, Shara's asking, how, how do we unlearn all we have become um, from adapting and, and being... basically not being ourselves for uh for lifetimes especially those diagnosed or self-realized later in life i think connecting with other autistics i think like Nora pride that mm -hmm. space i think that really is the start of it and you just get to talk to other people and it's like oh me too me too and then you realize you know kind of piecing things together like i wish um you know Nora, there was a space like Nora pride maybe you know when i found out eight years ago um, there wasn't, but there was like other groups that I joined, but people just kind of weren't, I think, as informed as maybe people in our community are right now, and you know, in Ireland in particular. Um, and yeah, it would have saved me a lot of like figuring stuff out. You know, I just think if someone had gone, that's trauma, that's trauma, that's trauma, that's being autistic, that's trauma. You know, it would have just saved a lot, a lot of time. And like, a lot of it is is rebuilding yourself, reconnecting to yourself, being kind to yourself, making time for yourself, um, working on boundaries. It's like you do things backwards. So it's kind of like you have to work on these boundaries because usually our boundaries are rubbish. So you kind of try to put in these, these boundaries and it's quite like you have to work at it. But then the more you, I think, fall in love with yourself again or reconnect with yourself again, they actually happen naturally. You just say no to stuff that doesn't suit you. You put yeah. yourself first. Yeah, you still do stuff for other people, but not like when you're exhausted or not at your own expense. So it's kind of, you know, to unlearn, you kind of have to start doing these things pur purpose purposefully. And then, then they kind of- Intentional, I think is the word. Well, inten what's intentional? Intentional. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's it. Um. um you go. But yeah, I mean, it's the thing. I mean, I harp on and on and on about community um, well, it is huge for a good important. reason, because it's the we're human beings. Um, and uh, this oh, we never gets said too much. We are human beings. And because we're human beings, we are members of a species that is designed to operate in a large complex social group. We, this is what we're made for. This is what our brains are designed for. The reason why humans have got giant brains is because we are a species that operates in a large complex social group. That's what, you, that's what you've got a big brain. Um, and one of the consequences of that is that when you get born, your brain's still not developed because there's no way you could get born if your brain was sufficiently developed. So you end up with your brain still developing for months and months and, and a couple of years after you get born, it gets bigger and it gets more complex because it's too big. I mean, it's not getting into kind of like the details of biology, but I'm sure people can envision what I'm talking about here. You know, the whole business of like, you know, the, the skull kind of like folding over and stuff like that, you know, to allow for, to be, to be born and then as the child is born the, the brain plates move or the skull plates separate out and then fuse and stuff it, because the brain is too big to be born it's as simple as that and um, we develop still after we're born but there's a huge consequence to that because the stuff that would have been written down and fused in place in most species before they were born is things that we are doing as human beings as infants in a social context. So the minute you get born, you're in contact with other human beings. You start to see other human beings interacting, you know? So why don't we see lots and lots of ADHD and autistic and stuff like that, um, gibbons and dogs and horses and stuff? It's because they don't develop their brain after they're born inside a complex social system. We are shaped by that, you know? Um, and you can't unravel all the way back because this is already hard coded into your brain, you know, in the first weeks and months of your life. All you can do is to, is to work out what it is. And like I said, using that word intentional or conscious, consciously and intentionously practice overcoming it, you know? 
Yeah, but that's um, the thing. But also you can change how you feel about yourself. And you can. And you can let go of a lot. You of can, things. yeah. But the thing is, you need to actually work out oh, what it is you feel about yourself and why. <laughs> what? Say that again? What you need to do, you do need to work out what it is you feel about yourself. Yeah. And why you feel it. Because sometimes you actually think, I mean, uh, this is, I have had this in myself where I've had things where I've felt that's something I'm proud about with myself. That's something I'm glad about for myself. But after when you start trying to dismantle these things, you start to think, no, I wasn't. All I was, what I was, that wasn't pride. That wasn't something I was, I enjoyed. It was something I was, it wasn't pride. It was relief. It was relief because it was getting me off the, the social hook, you know? Yeah. Because just to go back to the title of this, it's the prejudice. You're basically saying, I actually went under the prejudice radar. Um, and it's re relief, not self-love that you're feeling there. Um, we have to rebuild our emotions right from scratch almost. Um, and if you're just to randomly pick a number, if you were 30 years old and you came to the conclusion that you're autistic and that you've been masking most of your life and you wanted to try and go through that whole process um yeah. you've not only got to unravel 30 years of this and you don't have a guidebook of what where why and how you went about that in the first place you have to unravel all that subconscious stuff that you've built get back to your preschool days almost um, and start to figure out who you are all the stuff you're supposed to do when you're two and three and four and five, who you are, how you relate to other people, what you like about yourself, what you want to do with yourself, who you like and why. You have to rebuild all that stuff. Um, meanwhile, you have to do it as a 30-year-old adult who may well be in a job and has relationships and friendships. And you still have to sort of negotiate all of that while doing all these stuff. I and then you have to translate that into a way you can, you can express it to other people. I mean, again, you talking about having doing multiple jobs. You may find some some relationships, some people in your life that as well aren't good for you. You know, what I mean, part of putting these boundary places actually means, hang on, this person has literally been like encroaching on my boundaries, just basically taking pits for a month. You know what I mean? For all of our relationships, yeah. I learn those things too. Um, I'm just conscious of time, Mackie, because we happen to have yeah. slipped about 22 minutes over time there. <laughs> no bother. It's likely. I mean, it, you know, really small. You're, you're, the one, hey, you're the one running this. If you can't keep control of the time. It just got, uh, it's just really interesting. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I do need to finish it on time. Or, well, uh, not on time, but by now, because that's. Uh, yeah. You have to finish um, it not like, more than a half an hour over time. We started doing webinars. Like, remember, I did one with Kieran, and it was supposed to be three hours or something. <laughs> It turned out to be like five, six hours or something. We just get over two minutes. Yeah, it was like five hours, 20 minutes or something ridiculous. So yeah. Um, very quickly, uh, somebody's asking, is there anything I could do, uh, be, uh, could be doing as a parent to an autistic child to prepare them for mainstream school and to help them feel pride when all they want is to be like everyone else? Yes, here you go. I have a book that does exactly that. Embracing my neurodivergence because it is what? Well, no, it's at the back to front. I can't turn the. Is, are you reading it? Oh, you're pointing. You were pointing the other way. Are you trying to? Yeah, I was trying to figure out on my screen. I, I thought, hang on. Everyone sees these screens differently. So I'm like, oh, I give up. I don't yeah, know. Do yeah, that Good book. Try, though. Good try. But um, it is a workbook. It's basically letting kids and teens explore like what it means to be neurodivergent, what it means to be them, things they like about it, maybe stuff they don't like about it, what school is like for them. Um, talk about their special interests, uh, you know, basically different double empathy kind of in kids speak, explain to them, finding out ways that we can coexist. Like this book is probably for every child, to be honest, but like, <laughs> you know, we could all do with this. But it is about, because it is a question that comes up a lot. So I wanted to create something that was about kids exploring their identity and feeling um, proud of, of that as well, of themselves. The other thing I would say is I have a program myself and Orla wrote a program for schools. Uh, it's called Include. It's like a 10, it's for primary as well. You see, going into secondary school, you said, mainstream school, you just said. Um, this one's our primary school one. We will have one for secondary schools um, in October. We'll have it done in October. Um, but it is about teaching 
all children in school about like coexisting that we you know we all have these things going on in our lives we all have worries we all have different things that we don't like or we do we think differently we learn differently we are different but we're fundamentally very you know similar and human and we start looking at that um you know so they're two really good resources if you know i mean i just talked to my own child about like we're all different anyway so we're not the same as everybody else in the sense that we don't have to do the same as everybody else we don't have to like the same things as everybody else we can be different we can be our own person and everybody you know and i think children should be encouraged to be their own person the problem is a lot of kids aren't like the school system doesn't encourage that kind of individuality it is very samey samey we all have to dress the same look the same yes teacher no teacher sit down at the same time stand up at the same time you know so the system does that to children and then I suppose because that system is so much part of our lives parents do that to their kids as well so when we talk about children being individuals we don't actually kind of walk the walk a lot of the time um so I would talk to him about like differences like as in well other people in your class are going to be different for all these reasons you're just different because of these reasons but really these are just magnified we're just magnifying differences I think getting that point across to kids is is, is really important that like this is just a small difference. Like it is a small difference because our world is built on magnifying all these big, all these differences, whether it's race, gender, religion, whatever. We're just doing it again with neurotypes. Um, and it's, you know, we're fundamentally human. We all have the same, you know, emotional experience, feelings. We, you know what I mean? Our, our lives are pretty similar. We can empathize with each other. And I think focusing on those things, whether it's a young person or an older person, you know, it kind of puts things in perspective a bit because I do think sometimes, and even as you know, as you know, an advocate, sometimes you know, I focus too much on like our differences, explaining our differences. You know, I think we've taken a big U turn, Mackie, in the last two years. Maybe it's like actually we're we're not that different. Here's <laughs> here's a few little things that makes us different. Here's some stuff you need to understand. But basically, we're like you. And if you talk to people about you know the similarities. It makes it easier for people to empathize and identify and understand each other. That's the problem, isn't it? We start othering people. Oh, these people are so different from you. They can't, you can't possibly understand them. And like parents are told that sometimes, you know, as part of these tra parent training courses, like that their child will never understand them because that's the stupid theory of mind, you know, and, and all that kind of rubbish. And no, no truth to it at all. And that's like not really helpful to anybody. Very quickly, Kai is asking, can trauma affect um, friends and uh, friendships and relationships? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, trauma kind of shapes you, to be honest. Um, early childhood trauma shapes you. Um, More I, than that, and it needs to be said um, quite often, um, because things in the olden days were not quite as um, good as they are now crap and all as they may be today um things were spectacularly more appalling um in back in ye olden days called the 20th century <laughs> um and often pe parents pe people aren't conscious of the fact that their parents and their parents aren't conscious of the fact that they actually are working with trauma in their lives and that can that shapes the way you do yes it affects everything in your life but it affects the way you raise your children because people can actually teach hyper vigilance to their children um that's actually a really common one you know the, the parent is constantly telling the child be careful about that and don't mind that and well who is that person where do they come from you know don't go there all that kind of stuff this is hyper vigilance which you're transporting into your child because this is what you've learned you're doing the right thing and teaching your, the child the life lessons you've learned which is the right thing to do except that you've got the wrong life lessons yeah that's really good way of putting it isn't it um yeah. and that's you get that intergenerational trauma thing which has been poo-pooed by people um but is now generally being accepted as a really valid thing and there's awful lot of examples of it and it's very credible when you think about it it's it's what you get taught you know um and yeah you can you can get genetic inheritance of genes and predispositions that mean that that's why we've got like things like adhd and autistic people right through family lines and all the rest of it 
But the other thing is the subtle difference between inheritance um, and um, heritability. You, what, what you inherit from other people can be genes, can be carried by your genes, but you can also inherit what you're taught because people around you teach you the lessons they learned and you inherit that from them. So things like um, gender roles and socialization, um, class distinctions, racism. You know, we say, oh, children aren't born racist. No, they're not. But they're learning it and that, that is inherited from the people around them. Um, the same goes for all this stuff. And trauma is all part of that whole thing, you know? Anxiety, you know, as parents, we're like, be careful, don't fall off the thing. I think that's going to stop a child actually falling, you know, but it, that's our anxiety. We're passing on our anxiety. And then our kids are anxious. You know what I mean? We're like, why? Is it because of our anxiety talking, you know? And then I have, you know, we have to stop ourselves and go, but I climbed loads of walls as a kid and trees and fell sometimes. And I'm here, you know, it's like, we're literally, yeah, this hyper care is actually causing a lot of anxiety. Um, we need to wrap it up because I need to say thanks to everybody. And we know we could talk for another three hours, but we won't. People and I was just about to launch into a big essay on the topic of Jane Austen. And, yeah, um, I know. Uh, I actually recently watched Persuasion on Netflix. I think that's why it was fresh in my head. And I was like, right, autistic pride and prejudice. That's why we call it that. Um, before we wrap up, um, I know some people have mentioned ABA and, you know, that's a big part of not just prejudice, but abuse of autistic people. And uh, we are organizing a conference on the 13th of November online um, called Alternatives to ABA because we need to run away from ABA now, not move away from it, just like run away, slam the door, pretend it never happened, uh, you know, basically, and just move on from it because uh, a lot of people can't pretend it didn't happen to them. And, um, you know, along with prejudice, unfortunately, comes a lot of abuse. And it's kind of something we, we probably touched on, you know, here tonight, at, you know, definitely. But, um, you know, we would just hope that people might spread the word about that or, or, or come to us. The link's on our website under upcoming events. Because um, it is such a big, huge topic in our community. It's like one of the many battles we, you know, we have to fight right now. Um, but really educating people on the dangers of ABA, which is applied behavioral analysis and, you know, alternatives. If your child needs help if in support, whatever, there are other things that you can do uh, that don't harm your child. So it's going to be a brilliant event. Um, Mackie, thank you so much. For it's, been, it's lovely just having a chat now instead of having a pressure of the slides and the timekeeping. <laughs> um, so... Yeah. Yeah. After really after the after the webinar I did yesterday, which even though there were slides, it was much more free form. Yeah. Um, I, I think we as a, for community in the interest of community, I think that's something that we need to do more of. Um, just have a topic, maybe have a few um, talking points, yeah. and all just kind of let rip. <laughs> And just spend some time riffing on a subject and, and let it take us wherever. Because, I mean, you know, I didn't say an awful lot about pride or prejudice there during the course of that last whatever number of half hours. So, you know, when you think about it, but it doesn't matter because it was an excuse for us to get on here and just talk about things that people. Exactly. I love that. It was brilliant. Um, before yeah. we wrap up, actually, a question here. Do you know what percentage of people with, uh, with autism have experience trauma, abuse, short-term memory loss, um, et cetera. And very quickly, uh, estimates are around, well, not so much, well, yeah, it's uh, what 80% of us have anxiety disorders or high anxiety, 60%-ish have depression and 36% PTSD. Do I leave one out? Is there three? Trauma, anxiety, and- I guess it must be going with, to be honest with you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so that like that's how high those figures are. And I suppose actually it's a really good question. I usually throw those in somewhere. We didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about our mm. high suicide rates. There's loads of things we could have talked about tonight, but actually we had a, a fantastic discussion and hopefully it has moved things forward, maybe for some people as well. Um so everyone who's joined us live, thank you so much. Anybody watching the recording, thank you so much for sharing the space with us. Mackie. Thanks a million. Good night. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>